New Year Yev Akaram, August 4 to Rotterish. Uh, welcome back to part 5 of James Bonwick's uh, Irish Truths and Old Irish Religions, first printed in 1894. Uh, the next three chapters involved are one is on French Druidism, the other one is on Ger- German Druidism, and then we finally go on to what's called Druidical Magic. Now, the chapter on Druidical Magic is the long one, and it will be on um, what's co- on the vernacular manuscripts. Now bear in mind, all this has printed around the time of 1894, in which was the common academical th- thinking of the time. Gormagot. French Druidism. The Deru of Brittany were much more ancient, said Henry Martin, than those Druids known to the Romans, being primitive Druids, a sacerdotal caste of old Celts. Yet Furlong, who believed that the Gallic coast tribes, long traded and intermarried with Phoenicians, saw abundant evidences for their worshipping Astarte and Heracles. They were Saronidae, or judges. They were the builders, masons, or like Gabon Sayer, priestsmiths. Osayer O'Brien in his round tower says, The first name ever given in this body was Sayer, which has three significations, firstly free, second mason, and thirdly son of God. Keane calls him one of the Gooves or Cabri, such as you've ever seen him represented in Two to Dawn Cross at Clama Noise. A Breton poem, Arano, a dialogue between a druid and his pupil, is still sung by villagers as it may have been by their ancestors. The Venet of Caesar's story, the seat of the Irish druid of Drawl, was a draw. French writers have interested themselves in the Druidic question. The common impression is that Druids were only to be found in Brittany, but the other parts of France possessed these priests and bards. Certainly, the northwest corner of the regions of megalithic remains continued later to be their haunt, being less disturbed there. It was Brittany also that the before-mentioned Oriental mysticism found so safe a home and was nurtured so assiduously. But Druids were equally known in the south, centre, northeast of France. These young Druids, or Vesses, were described in 1621 by Gunbot of Dijon in Le de Chenot, Prince de Vaches Druids, Celtic du Noir. Upon the tomb, the arch Druid Sinandot was found an inscription in Greek, thus rendered by the Dijon author. On ce tombeau, Dans le sacre bocage du Diamitras et continue le corps. Le kinde grand prest marchant hors de Dieu sonneurs de gardon de dommage. Numbers of the learned went to view this inscription and an urn found within the tomb. Mitras was a form of Apollo or the sun. There were other evidences of the southern Gaulish Druze using Greek characters beyond Caesar's assertions. Gunbald spoke of the prohibition of the Druidical religion by the Emperor Augustus, Tiberius and Claudius, adding that the Druids Brunt chasse de mong Druids O Druid Prostosum a cause de leur trop pro sacrifice dom. He declared that after the general edict of Claudius Il n'a son trava pleu parmi le Gwala. When banished from Gaul, they retired to Britain, though Druidesses were mentioned as being at Dijon at the time of Aurel. Bordeaux, in 1777, published Memoir à Consulte pour les Echantudes Guala, intended as a vindication of them against the strictures of Bali in his letters to Voltaire. He had a great belief in the astronomical skill of the Druids, from their use of the 30 year cycle, the revolution period of the Saturn. At the Congress of Arras in 1853, the question debated was, up to what period Ro- Roman polytheism had penetrated the Belgic Gaul? And up to what period continued the struggle between polytheism and Christianity? The French author remarks, the Romans did but one thing, give the names of their gods to the divinities of the people of uh, Flanderland. And the divinities, what were they? Evidently, those of the country from which the people had been forced to flee. Isabri and Bachelet, in their Dictionnaire de Biographie, etc., 
affirm that the Celtic word Darud from De or D God and Rod or Riud speaking signifies interpreter of the gods or one who speaks from the gods. According to others, the etymology should be in the Gaelic language, Durict, divination, magic, or better known as Dern, Oak, and Wood, Mistletoe. Acknowledging the ancient renown of their knowledge, it is admitted to be imperfectly known to us through Pythagoreans pretending to be the founders thereof. The French authors had the following count of the Druid's great charm. They carried suspended from their neck, as a mark of dignity, a serpent's egg, a sort of oval ball of crystal that in time of Pliny tradition pretended to be the product of the form of a quantity of serpents, grouped and interlaced together, this egg having the origin of a crowd of superstitions which up to a century ago were in vogue in Cornwall, Wales and the mountains of Scotland. They used to carry these balls of glass called serpent stones, to which they attributed particular virtues. <coughs> Druidesses of Gaul had a sanctuary in the Isle of Sina, Finisterre. Druidism in France is condemned as, la as late 658 by the Council of Nantes and later on by the Capitularies of Charlemagne. Renown supposed that Druidism remains form exclusively national. Justin's remark that the Greek colony of Marseille civilised the Gauls may help to explain how Gaulish Druids knew Greek and how some French writers traced Druidism to the Ephesians of Southern Gaul. Then again, we have Amenus Marcellus saying, the Druids were formed into fraternities as the authority of Protagoras decreed. Caesar, in his account of Gaulish Druids, had clearly in his mind his own country's fate. They were like his own augurs, and their arch Druid was his Pontifu Maximus. Darbaud de Jumonville, in his account of Irish mythology, has, of course, references to the Druids. He lays emphasis on the difference between those of Gaul and those of our islands. The judicial authority was vested in the Philippe. These need not, like the Druids, proper celebrate sacrifices. He traces the word Philly, a seer, from the same root as the Breton give out to see. The French author records that Polyhistor. Timagenus, Valerius Maximus, and others wrote of the Northwestern men holding Pythagorean doctrines. But he adds that while a second birth was regarded by the Pythagoreans as a punishment of evil, it was esteemed by the others as a privilege of heroes. German Druidism. Louis de Becker, 1858, gave an account of Teutonic Druidism, similar to that of the Belgae of Britain, in his de la région du nord de la France avant le christianisme. He, unlike men of the Welsh Druidic school, joins Dr. Ledwidge and some Irish authorities in tracing Druidism to the German and Scandinavian races, saying, the religion of our pagan ancestors was that of Odin or Woden. But he evidently refers to northeastern France rather than northwestern, as he derives the religion from the Edda. In the book, Baluspa, or the Priestess, the first song of the poetic Edda, he discovers that uh, Oshin and other British and Irish bards describes as spirits of the air, of the earth, of waters, of plains and woods. Caesar was deceived, says he, when he said that the Germans had neither priests nor religious ceremonies, for Tacticus mentions them in his Germania in the most formal manner. By the way, if Caesar was so mistaken about the Germans, whom he knew so well, in his evidence about Gaulish priests worth so much. Bacchus Northern Gauls had priests of various kinds. The sacrifices were called the blood manor, or plusari. The sustainers of order were Ewart and Scotswort. The protectors of sacred woods, Harugari, Parvari, and Betismart. The prophets, Spamdar, Visigo, Vitiga, Vitsiga, Vesagar, Betki. Priestesses were the Valor, the horse, bull, a boar, and sheep were sacrificed. It was in the middle of the wood, he writes, that the Belgae offered their sacrifices. The Belgic Britons doubtless had a similar druidism. Caesar asserts that the Germans had no druids, while he credits the German Belgae of South Britain as having them.
Juridical magic. As to magical arts exercised by Druids and Druidesses, the ancient Irish manuscripts are full of stories about them. Joyce has said, the Gaelic word for druidical is almost always applied where we should use the word magical. To spells, incantations, metamorphoses, and so on. Not even China, at the present day, is given more to charms to spells than was Ireland of old. Constant application of the druidic arts upon the individual must have given a sadness and terror to life continuing long after the druid had been supplanted. It was comfort to know that a magician could be pitted against magician, and that, though one might turn a person into a swan or a horse, another could turn him back again. Yet, chewing one's thumb was sometimes an, an effectual a disenchanter as the elevation of marking of the cross in subsequent centuries. Dustin once Fionn was once invited to take seat beside a fair lady on her way to a palace. He, having some suspicion, put his thumb between his teeth, and she immediately changed into an ugly old hag with evil in her heart. That was a simple mode. of detection, but may have been effective only in the case of a hero such as Fionn. Certainly, many a bad spirit would have been expelled in a rising quarrel if one party was wise enough to put his thumb between his teeth. Charmongers who could take off a spell must have been popular characters, as well as useful as war removers. It is a pity, however, that the sacred salmon, which is used to frequently wine, is missing now. When examinations are so necessary as he or she who has bit a piece of forgot nothing ever after. Balor, the Fomorian king, was a good natured fellow, for finding that a glance in his right eye caused death to a subject, he kept his eyes closed, constantly closed. One way of calling spirits from the deep to do one's will was to go to sleep with the palms of both hands upon the cheek. The magic cauldron was not such a requirement as with the Welsh. Where it was a druidic trick to take on an idol to bed and lay the hands to the face and discover the secret of riddle and dreams. Another trick reminds one of the skill of modern spiritualistic mediums who could discover the history of a man by a piece of his coat, for Cormac read the whole life of a dog from the skull. Healing powers were magical. Our forefathers fancied that a part of enjoyment in heaven was fighting by day and feasting at night. It had cut off in daylight, conflict resuming its position when the evening table was spread. The rival forces of Fomorians and the Dawn had druids whose special work was to heal the wounded at night, so as to be ready for the next morning's battle. In the story of Deirdre, it is written, As Connor saw this, he went to Coppad the druid, and he said to him, Go, Coppad, unto the sons of Ushna, and play druidism upon them. This was done. He had recourse to his intelligence and art to restrain the children of Ushna, so that he laid them under a enchantment, that is, by putting them a viscosity of whelming waves. Nothing was more common than the raising of druidic fogs. It would be easier to do that in Ireland or Scotland than Australia, for example. The story of Coo speaks of a king, Rudin, who made a black fog of druidism by his driot or magic. Druidic winds were blasting as they came from the east. The children of Lurp were made in under the Irish Sea till the land became Christian. The wonderful story in an old manuscript respecting Dermot is connected with the threatening divorce of the lovely Mugan. As no prince appeared to her husband, the king. On this, says the chronicler, Queen went to Finan, a magus or druid, of Baal or Bellus, and to Espad named Ea, son of Beg, and told him she was barren. The retair, or the chief of Druids, then consecrated some water, which she drank, and conceived. And then the product of her womb was a white lamb. Woe is me, said Mogon, to bring forth a four-footed creature. Not so, replied Finine, for your womb is thereby sanctified, and the lamb must be sacrificed as your firstborn. The priest blessed the water for her, and she drank and conceived. Say the priest, you shall now bring forth a son, and he shall be king of Ireland. Then Finin and Espad Eir. Ea blessed the queen, and the seed of her loins, and giving her more consecrated water, she drank it, and called his name Aislain, because he was saved from the sacrifice. Well, mighty Valencia exclaimed, The whole of the story was strong Chaldean paganism, 
and could not have been invented by any Christian monks, whatever. Who called him a bolster was much given to by magic. He caught birds by it. He left his wife to be with a lady in fairyland. Caught by spells, he was brought back home. He drank the draught of forgetfulness that he might not remember fairyland, and she drank to forget her jealousy. All this is in Laura Nohij. When the Dedanan raised storms to drive off the invading hosts of the Milesians, this is a spell used by Milesis, as taught in the Book of Invasions, or Laura Kabbalah. I pray that they reach the land of, of Aaron, those who are riding upon the great and productive vast sea, that there may be a king for us in Tara, that noble Aaron will be a home for the ships and boats of the son of Milius. By the 14th canon of the Synod of Armagh, as asserted in the year 448, a penance was exacted for any soothsaying or the foretelling of future events by an inspection of animals' entrails, as was the practice with the Druids. It is curious to see how this magic was by the early writers associated with Simon Magus, so much that, as Rhys observes, the Gaelic Druids appear at times under the name of the school of Simon Druid. Pion was once coursing his dog Bran, when the hair suddenly turned into a lady, weeping for the loss for a ring in the lake. Like a gallant, a gallant, the hero dived down and got it, but all he got his trouble was to be turned by her into a white-haired old man. On another occasion, he was trained to use change in a grey fawn, but Fionn endured the metamorphosis of twenty years as a hog, one hundred a stag, one hundred an eagle, and thirty a fish, besides living one hundred as a man. The heroine, Care, had to be alternately a swan and a woman. The Kilkenny transactions referred to one Liban, transformed by for over 300 years as a fish, or rather a mermaid, with her lapdog in the shape of an otter after. Bevan, however, caught her in a net and had her baptised, and then she died. In the fate of the children of Lyr, we read of Aoife, second wife of Lyr, jealous of her husband's children, by her, his first mate, turned him into four swans till her spell could be broken. This happened under the two rule and lasted 900 years. They are reported to have had, Thou shalt fall in great revenge for it, for thy power for our destruction is not greater than the druidic power of our friends to avenge it upon thee. However, having musical qualities, they enjoyed themselves enchanting every night. At last they heard the bells of Hartrick. This broke the spell. They sang to the High King of Heaven, reveals their name and cried out, Come to baptise us, O cleric, for our death is near. An odd story of the Druid man is preserved in the Oshin transactions. It is concerned a magical branch bearing nine apples of gold. They who shook the tree were lulled to sleep by music, forgetting want or sorrow. Through that, Cormac, son, grandson of Con of the Hundred Fights, lost his wife, Etna, son Carb and daughter Eva. At the end of a year's search and passing through a dark magical mist, he came to a hut where a youth gave him a pork supper. The entertainer proved to be Manon. The story runs, at, after this Manon came to him in his proper shape and said thus, I, it was who bore this tree away from thee. I, it was who gave thee the branch, and it was in order to bring thee to this house. It was I that worked magic upon you, so that you might be with me tonight in friendship. You may be doubtful if this satisfied King Cormac. A chessboard often served the purpose of divination. The laying on of the hands may be in remote antiquity, and an effectual motor and transmission of a charm. But a magical wand or rod in proper hands has been the approved method of transformation, or any other miraculous interposition. There is one one story relative to the romance of Grania and Dermot. Then came the Rector again, having a magic wand of sorcery, and struck his son with that wand, so that he made him a cropped pig, having neither ear nor tail, and he said, I conjure thee that thou have the same length of life as Dermot of Duvna, and that it be by thee he should fall at last. This was a boar that killed, not the Syrian Adonis, but a similar sun deity, Dermot. When Fionn, this disappointed husband in pursuit of the runaway, found the abductor dying, he was entreated by the beautiful solar hero to save him. 
how can I do it? Asked the one half repentant, Fionn. Easily said the wounded one, for when thou didst get the no precious gift of divining at the boin, it was given to thee at whomever thou should give a drink to the palms of thy hands. He should after that be young and sound from every sickness. Unhappily, Fionn was so long debating with himself as to his gift to his enemy that when he walked towards him with the water, life had departed from the war stricken Irish Adonis. Dr. W. R. Sullivan has a translation of the Fair of Carmel concerning three magicians and the mother from Athens. By charms and spells and incantations, the mother blighted every place, and it was through magical devastation and dishonesty that the men dealt out destruction. They came to Aaron to bring evil upon the two to dawn by blighting the fertility of the soil, and the two were angry at this, and they sent against them a son of Aleph, and the part of their poets, and Greedenbell, and the part of their sectors, and Lou Levan, the son of Cocker, on the part of their druids, and Bakul, on the part of the witches, to pronounce incantations against them. And these never parted from them until they forced the three men over the sea, and they left the pledge behind them. For example, Carmen, their mother, that they would never return to Aaron. A counter charm is given in the Sinkus Moor. When the Druids brought poison to St. Patrick, the latter wrote off the liquor. Cubi fi fri ubu, fri ubu anfis, prispru ua ibu lihu, Christu Jesus. He left it on record that whoever pronounced these words of poison or liquor should receive no injury from it. It might be useful with Irish whiskey, only translator ends that the words of the charm like most of the charms of the Middle Ages, appear to have had no meaning. Spiritualism in all its forms appeared to have been practiced by the Irish and Scottish Druids. Dr. Armstrong's Gaelic Dictionary has an account of divination of the Togarium, once a noted superstition amongst the Gaels and evidently derived from Druid serving ancestors. The so-called prophet was wrapped in the warm smoking robe of a new slain ox or cow, and laid at full length in the wildest recesses of some lonely waterfall. The question was then put to him, and the oracle was left in solitude to consider it. The steaming body cultivated the frenzy for a reply, although it was firmly believed to have been communicated by invisible beings. Similar traditions are related by Kennedys in the fictions of the Irish Celts. One of the tales is that of the Skolog, who spent his father's gold. While out hunting, he saw an old man betting his left hand against his right, and once he played with him for sixpence, with one of the ancient druid a hundred guineas. Next man won, and the old fellow was made rebuild the Irishman's mill. Another victory brought him a wife, a princess from the far country. But Sabina, when married, besought to have no more to do with her old lassa booked of the glen. Things went on well a good while till the man wanted more gold and he ventured upon a game losing he was directed to the old druid the sword of light sabina helped her husband to a druidic horse that carried him to her father's castle and there he learned he learned was held by another brother also a druid in an enchanted place with a black steed he left the wall and was driven out by the magic sword at last through fiat the druid the sword was given to lassa Boot. The cry came, take your sword of light, and off what he said. Then the unspelled wife reappeared, and the couple were happily ever after. Con of the Hundred Battles is often mentioned in connection with the Druids. One of the old Irish manuscripts thus introduces the magical stone of Tara. One evening, Con repaired at sunrise to the battlements of the Rira, or Royal Fortress at Tara, accompanied by his three Druids, Mail, Block, and Bukney and his three poets, Ethan, Corb, and Cesar. For he was accustomed every day to repair this place with the same company for the purpose of watching the firmament, that no hostile aerial beings should descend upon Aaron unknown to him. By standing in the usual place this morning, Con appeared to tread but on a stone, and meet his stones streaked under his feet, so as we heard all over Tara, and throughout all Brega and our East Meath, or East Meath. Con then asked his druids why the stone had shrieked, and its name was, 
and what it was said. The Druids took 43 days to consider and returned with the following answer, Fal, the name of the stone, for it came from Inish Fal, or the island of Fal. It has shrieked under your royal feet, and the number of shrieks which the stone has given forth is the number of kings that will succeed you. At the Battle of Maitara with the Fawarans, it is said that the chief men of the two of dawn called their smiths, the brass workers, the sorcerers, their druids and their poets, and so on. The druids were engaged putting the wounded in a bat of herbs and then returning them whole to the battle ranks. Nash, who showed much scepticism respecting druids in Britain, wrote, In the Irish tales, on the contrary, a magician under the name of the Dri or Dru, magician or druid, Driacht, Driacht, magic plays considerable part. The cavalry play a great part according that some authors. One speaks of a magical sound, that is to say, a cover. A charm against evil spirits found at Poitiers, half Gaelic, half Latin. Professor Lautner saw that the Gallic words were identical with expressions still used in Irish. We are told that a rebel chief was helped by a druid against the King of Munster to plague the Irish in the southwest with magically drying up all the water. The king succeeded in finding another druid who brought forth an abundant supply. He did but cast his javelin, and a mighty spring burst forth at the spot where the weapon fell. Still the druidical grandfather of another king of Munster had a magical black horse which won at every race. Elsewhere, the chapter in the Two of the Dawn is concerning whom were so many of Druids. Attention is drawn to Reese to the tendency of higher races to ascribe magical powers to lower ones, or rather to the conquered. A Druid's council was sometimes of service. A certain dwarf magician of Ergil, uh, Count Car- D- Derry, had done a great deal of mischief before he could be caught, killed, and buried. It was not long before he rose from dead and resumed his cruelties. Once more slain, he managed to appear again at his work, and Drew advised Fionn McCool to bury the fellow the next time head downwards, which effectually stopped his magic and his resurrection powers. Fenton was not a hero of antiquity. When the deluge occurred, he managed by druidic arts to escape. Subsequently, through the ages, he manifested himself in various forms. This was to O'Flaherty an evidence that Irish Druids believed in the doctrine of metapsychosis. Fenton's grave is still to be recognised, although he has made no appearance on earth since the days of King Dermot. It is not safe to run counter to the Druids. When King Cormac turned against the craft, Melgan incited the Shivre, sorry, Shifre, an evil spirit to take revenge. By turning himself into a salmon, he succeeded in choking the sovereign with one of his bones. He was Faeclan, druid of King Dermot, who made the wonderful Arvi Drua, or magical charm, that caused the death of 3,000 warriors. The king was once plagued by a lot of birds whenever he went. He inquired to his druid, Becnia, as to the place where they came from. The answer was, from the east. Then came the order, bring me a tree from every wood in Ireland. That was to get the right material to serve as a charm. Tree after tree failed to be of use, only that the wood of Crossmunia produced what was required for a charm. Upon the dictal or incantation being uttered, the birds visited the king no more. In the Book of Lacan is the story of a man who underwent some remarkable transformations. He was 300 years a deer, for 300 wild boar, for 300 a bird, and for the like age a salmon. In the latter state, he was caught and partially eaten by the queen. The effect of this repast was the birth of Tuma uh, Coral, who told the story of the antediluvian colonization of Ireland. One druid, Trostain, had a bat of milk of 30 white-faced cows, which rendered his body invulnerable to poisoned arrows in battle. A druid once said to die, I have consulted the clouds and man of Erin, and found that thou wilt soon return to Tara, and wilt invite the provincial kings and chiefs of Erin to the great feast of Tara. And therein thou shalt decide upon the making an expedition into Alba, Britain, France, and following the conquering footsteps of the great Uncle Nile. He succeeded in Alba, but died in Gaul. A brother of his became a convert to Patrick. Grania, the heroine of the elopement with the beautiful hero Dermot, or Dermot fell into her trouble through a druid named Der Drunok McMorna. She was the daughter of King Cormac, whose grave is still shown at Tarn, 
but she was betrothed to the aged gigantic sovereign Fionn de Vinian, or Fionn Macoul. At a banquet in honour of the alliance, the Druid said to the lady the names and qualities of the chiefs assembled, particularly mentioning the graceful Dermot. She was smitten by his charms, particularly a love mark on his shoulder, and readily agreed to break her promised vows in order to share his company. When she fled with him, Fionn and his son pursued the couple, who were aided in their flight by another Druid named Durang, styled a skilful man of science. A fine poem, The Fate of the Son of Ushnok, relates the trials of Deirdre the Fair. Dr. Keating has his version. Caffa the Druid foreboded and prophesied for the daughter just born that numerous mischiefs and losses that would happen upon the province of Ulster on her account. Upon hearing this, the nobles proposed to put her to death forthwith. Then, not be done so, cried Connor the king, but I will take her with me and send her to be reared, that she may become my own wife. It was in his close retreat that she was seen and loved by Nassi, the son of Ushnok, and this was brought into fearful war between Ulster and Alba. The Book of Leinster has a story of one that loved the queen, who returned the compliment, but was watched too well to, uh, to meet with him. He, he, however, was his foster brother returned by a druidic spell into two beautiful birds, and so gained entrance into the la lady's bower, making their escape again by a bird transformation. The king had some suspicion and asked his druid to find the secret. Next time the birds flew, the king had his watch, and soon they resumed their human appearance. He set upon them and killed them both. The Book of Leinster records several cases of druids taking opposite sides in battle. It was a Greek meet in Greek. The northern druids plagued the southern men by drawing up the wells. Book Magra of the south drove the silver tube into the ground and the spring burst forth. Ketru made a fire and set a charm on his mountain ash stick, and in a black sent a black cloud down a shower of blood. Nothing daunted, the other druid, Mogrot, transformed three noisy northern druids into stones. Spiritualism, as appears in the banquet of Duna Gabe, was used this. This is the way it is to be done. The poet chews a piece of the flesh of the red pig, or of a dog, or of a cat, and brings it afterwards on a flag behind the door, and chants an incantation upon it, and offers it to idle gods, and his idle gods are brought with him, and he finds them not in the morrow. And he pronounces incantations on his two palms, and his idle gods are also brought to him, in order that his sleep may not be interrupted, and that he lays his two palms on his two cheeks, and thus falls asleep, and he is watched in order that no may disturb or interrupt him, until everything which he is engaged is revealed to him, which may be a minute or two or three, or as long as the ceremony requires, one palm over the other across his cheek. The author of The Golden Bow, J. G. Fraser, judiciously reminds us that the superstitious, sorry, the superstitious beliefs and practices, which may have been handed down by word of mouth, are generally far more arch archaic type than the religions depicted in the most ancient literature of the Aryan race. A careful reading of the chapter on the superstitions of the Irish will be convincing on that point. Among ancient superstitions of the Irish was some relation to the sacred cow, reminding one of India or even the Egyptian worship of Apis. In the Oceanic transactions refer to this peculiarity. There was this celebrated Glas Govna, or grey cow, of the smith of the magical to the dawn. This serviceable animal has fed a large family and a host of servants. The Fomorians envied the possessor and their leader stole her. The captive continued her benefit, sorry, beneficent gifts for many generations. Her ancient camps are still remembered by the peasantry. And other stories of King Dermot Mac Kerbal, that of a druid and half Christian, who killed his son for destroying a sacred cow. But Owen Conlon has a translation of the proceedings of the Great Bardic Institute, which contains a narrative of a cow, which supplied at uh, Tum Duvlan, the daily wants of nine score nuns, and his ladies must have been druidesses. The word calic meaning, uh, equally meaning nuns and druidesses. As W. Hackett remarks, the probability is that they were pagan druidesses and the cows were living idols, like Apis, or in some sense considered sacred animals. One points out the usefulness of the Irish druids in a day when our enchantments uh, prevailed. Eten, wife of Eckert, was carried off by Midder, through the roof, and two swans were seen in the air above Tower, 
joined together by a golden yoke. However, the husband managed to recover his stolen property by the aid and mighty spell of his druid.